This video starts with a short clip from the Searle Hadowich collection of conversations with the famous Norman MacLean, sadly no longer with us, but well known as a writer, singer, piper, actor, comedian, and all round entertainer. After the clip comes a discussion between linguists at universities in Scotland, India, and Jamaica working together on the Mediating Multilingualism Project and other interested individuals with a close professional, parental, or community involvement in language and languages. Hello and welcome to our second session of our Talking Points with Norman McLean discussion series. Um, and our topic this time is language hierarchies, uh, addressing the question of an English ascendancy. We have the same panel that we had last time, so I don't need to do lots of long introductions. Um, and we're going to be following more or less the same format, though perhaps tweaking it slightly. Um, so we'll start, uh, as we did last time, with a short clip from Norman, uh, highlights of a, a longer seven minute session. And the, the link to that session, which everyone has viewed beforehand, is given below in the YouTube description. And you'll also find uh, a transcript of what Norman is saying uh, in, in English translation there. So let's see Norman first. As the legitimate Anna Grosso, the part in Kevo, Illinois, that the fiction or the bear yenigat, bear the use of that. Sure. That there are uses in bear the famishing, or they have others that actually are some of the fallus, they got some arch, famia pick and bear the vehicle. Ach, stay show. Han <laughs> Be Vilva, come on, Kutrimok, as a dove. Achmer of me, uh, how the fellow gather me those me, soccer a pair of tending a mandarin youthful. Could you appeal the Beth Hillman a son? He had plenty of a day, had on. So, I mean, so read or mean, sir, this departed and as the hidden in Hose a sort of. Jungsich <laughs> A Kadian, a Sanyaklish, a Tor Kormon, could be plain garlic. So, a Kuzu was cool the garlic, it is. Jenadahuj. Shin Shin Mahon. So, that was Norman, his own thoughts. Um, and now I'd like to invite Uday to respond to that um, from his own perspective um, in the first instance. And then after that, we'll change the format slightly and get some more experiential accounts of this topic um, from uh, uh, Kalyan, uh, perhaps Jane, and, and certainly Audrey um, in, in after that, before um, Crocker and Joseph come back in with some more uh, academic perspectives on the topic. Okay, so over to you, Uday. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gordon. I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, clearly. Um, what happened in the Indian context, let me tell you, uh, go back to a few hundred year old history of how English ascendancy happened. Because a few hundred years ago, the language of the law court, the language of official transcripts, and the language of the rulers, this was Urdu, Persian, and therefore, without learning Farsi, 
you couldn't do much. So the great reformer, Raja Ramon Roy, uh, he knew Persian very well, Arabic very well, but for the traditional knowledge base, he learned Sanskrit. And of course, his English was impeccable. But let's remember that this was a period when we had people who were native speakers of English ruling the country. It was thought of wise uh, at that particular point of time for the parents to send their children to the English medium schools because English medium schools were all a new entity at that particular point of time. We had the madrasas, the traditional Islamic learning. We had the parshalas or the gurukuls, the traditional Hindu uh, Indian style of learning. And we didn't have an English education system, but we very quickly had the English education system. But the problem was very interesting. The problem was that some of those who were from the uh, rulers thought that not everybody needs to know English so well. Many of them might do much all right if they could learn English, how to, how to write properly and how to read properly. So the writing, reading comprehension, that was emphasized that. So only some would need to speak English very well and hear and respond to that very well. So therefore, there were two kinds of English education schools that were set up. One where English and only English was allowed. The other, which was uh, partly the native language and partly English. So these two kinds of schools existed side by side in India. And there, of course, the third kind of school, which was purely Indian language medium schools. The schools had to use English for science teaching. So even those schools which used English partly and say Bengali partly, would use Bengali for the softer science and English for the harder science. That was the situation. Now, for that, even for that, we needed a school book society. So 1816 was the year when the school book society was established and the science books, as well as many of the economics and other kind of books, they were begun being written in our languages. I remember Kerry when he was writing Bengali grammar to teach Bengali to the English uh, newly recruited officers, his son Felix Kerry was writing in Bengali a book on economics. So you can easily see that that is a period of time during Fort William College beginning. This was this strategy was being adopted. Now by by 1947, when the British left, we did not have the chance of speaking to a mother tongue, uh, you know, knowledgeable speakers, managers of language in that sense of English. We learned English from those who learned English from the uh, Englishmen. So therefore, it was a twice removed kind of situation after 1947. So after, and by 1947, between 1816 School Book Society and 1947, huge amount of texts were written in our languages in all kinds of sciences. So there were things available in 1947 in physics, you can learn in Bangla or in Hindi. So you could learn many of the harder sciences also through Indian languages. So the opinion was clearly divided. Where should we send our children? Should we send our children to the schools where they can understand the sciences well in our own language? Or should we send children to the schools where they'll be quite removed from the home language and learn everything through English? Now, parents were not really very really clear in 1947 as to what they should do. But soon enough, they noticed that the English law remained as it were. 
the constitution was written in english and there was of course hindi translation but it was stated that it is the english version that shall prevail the, the official bureaucracy preferred using english uh more or less there was no television those days but more or less they noticed that in formal contexts one had to learn english one had to use english now as the time went by the demand for english grew in india and when particularly media entered uh particularly when privatization happened and uh, television entered and radio fm channels were also started uh there was greater demand for english now we must remember that english not only in india but in many countries like india came along with the capitalism whereas india wanted to be socialist democratic republic but the market forces may not allow india to remain so so whatever you might try to do market forces will try to extract the english version of yourself for their benefit now that was a big problem second big problem was that there is a textbook market and the publishing uh, you know racket that if you print textbooks for indian syllabus in english then you can sell it to all over india very easily where if you have to publish textbooks in digital languages then you have to print in 20 different languages that's a tough task uh i was talking about satyan bose of the famous bose and einstein theory uh, who also was the vice chancellor of shanti niketan vishwavarathi uh, as a great physicist he would say that if you did not know uh, how to teach physics in bangla then perhaps you don't know physics because if you knew physics you could easily teach in bangla language and that was the kind of stand which was being taken by great scientists of india great technology people in india but the common people in their perception their uh, idea of seeing their children settled is to push them into banks public sector undertakings government jobs all of these require you know english the babudam requires english and therefore english ascendancy you no know, went up the other thing that was noticed by, by the people in the universities even those who favored indian language education that between 1947 and 1985 there's very interesting statistics which comes out in bjorn jenner and baldauf uh, their work which shows that in 1940s biological sciences 80% of the original essays which got the patent they were written in russian engineering most of the disciplines in german lot of other kinds of sciences in french so the english ascendancy did not happen in knowledge systems whereas in 19 by 1985 they have already shown demonstrated discipline by discipline that english had won over the other international languages so much so that there is hardly any french scientist who would now be uh, you know uh, circumspect about the english who would have to learn to speak in english in the international language i remember in 1985 when i went to world congress of linguistics in berlin uh, there were lots of people in different sections teach, uh, talking or presenting their papers in russian in german in french today if you go to the same world congress you would find that all of them prefer to speak in english even though privately they will speak in their own languages so english ascendancy for the knowledge system people happened and india only responded to that and i am sure many other countries the history has been in the same way so that is something which is very interesting uh, which i would say okay thank you uday thank you very much um, and uh, that's uh, Uh, a fine, fine historical sweep you've given us of of the development of 
the English ascendancy in, in your own context. And I'm sure it's, it brings all sorts of bells for other people too. Um, we're going to slightly change our format this time in comparison with last time, because now uh, I want to get some more experiential accounts uh, around this topic of English ascendancy before we come back to uh, uh, our academic colleagues in Jamaica and Scotland to respond. Um, so, uh, Kalyan, first of all, if you would give us the benefit of your own experience, uh, particularly your professional experience as a, as a provider of uh, community interpreting services, um, I wonder how you're reacting to what we've seen from Norman and what we've also heard from Uday. So I just wanted to appreciate Uday's presentation briefly. Uh, the thing that came to mind when Uday was speaking was Thomas McCauley's Minutes on Education, which um, formally and explicitly uh, restricted the level to which most English uh, Indian Babus or Clarks uh, were entitled to be educated to because their main purpose and function was to serve the British administration. To my experiences, I was going to say, as an English speaker, I seldom personally experienced direct linguistic uh, hierarchism, if you like, in Britain or in, in any English speaking country, uh, except as a function of blatant racism or a racist color blindness of the well or ill intentioned kind. Uh, during my first visit to Britain in the summer of 1980, our overnight coach from London to Edinburgh halted at two in the morning at a motorway cafe in Doncaster, Yorkshire. As I squinted to try and read the menu stuck on the door, a group of white teenagers lounging inside saw me and decided to come out. One placed his face in my face and unleashed a torrent of what sounded like working class string of mock Indian words or sounds or Indian accented slang English. They all laughed. I headed for the toilet. Unfortunately, that was outside too, in the dark, in the back. They surrounded me inside, whistling. I quickly exited onto the better lit pathway and dived into the cafe, losing them. As a new junior lecturer in Coventry, um, I and my white English boss stood confused and bemused as the dinner lady asked her, and what's he having? Uh, we both just burst out laughing at this uncannily immediate real life illustration of the example we had been discussing in our anti-racism trainers briefing session just before breaking for lunch, where we used the example, does he take sugar? Uh, more serious examples sometimes came second or third hand, and I hope my memory serves me right. A senior lecturer in our training team, a very dark skinned, slightly pockmarked Ugandan Asian gentleman, an ex national hockey star from Uganda who spoke 11 languages, including highly polished English with a rugby school accent, routinely received uncomprehending blank stares from his local white bank tellers when he greeted them at the counter. Once a concerned white English health professional requested him to see if with his 11 languages, he could perhaps crack a seeming mystery. A distressed Asian mental health patient sectioned in um, the ward for four years had been known to break into animated apparent gibberish quite frequently at mealtimes. Turned out she had been desperately asking for the occasional Indian meal with chapatis in Gujarati, but no one had bothered to check till now. As the coordinator of the Interpreting and Translating Service, I was once invited to Sochton Prison in Edinburgh to see if I could help a Chinese inmate there. When he was jailed for murder 10 years earlier, his English was virtually non-existent and he was offered uh, no interpreter at all to put his own side of the story to anyone. Now, 10 years later, this handsome, clean cut, polite young man spoke very clear English, having taught himself the language in prison as well as law. He tearfully, but with great propriety and almost professional self-restraint, entreated me to trigger a review, 
insisting he had been framed. My Chinese predecessor in the job had campaigned for years against the practice of English-only registration forms being left dangling unexplained and unsignposted at health service receptions and clinics and hospitals. His mostly rural-derived women clients from Hong Kong were often illiterate, even in Chinese. They frequently waited in those reception lounges, unserved for a while before leaving. There was no proactive guidance, service, or translated signposting or explanatory literature, and they, many of them with urgent care needs, simply felt like ciphers. In France, around the same time, a woman who had come into a hospital for a pregnancy checkup was wrongly given an abortion before anyone realized what was happening. Staff there had not bothered noting the clear difference between her full Vietnamese name and the full name of another Vietnamese woman, patient, actually waiting for that procedure. Community-based interpreting and translating services started to be grudgingly set up as a public service in Britain, initially only in the voluntary sector and purely as an adjunct to health or local uh, community council authority or legal services, uh, only following uh, several, uh, or immigration and refugee services, only following in the wake of a series of race relations acts, which themselves were legislated following a decade or two of major uprisings and struggles across cities in Britain, such as Birmingham's Handworth, Brixton, Toxteth in Liverpool and so on, Cardiff. Um, the key case in this was some, something called the Iqbal Begum case. Iqbal Begum had been jailed for life in 1981 for murdering her abusive husband. In 1985, a chance visitor discovered that Mrs. Begum had not had any clue as to what was being said to her and what the language mediator was either asking her or saying to her, so she had stayed silent in her confusion. This silence had been interpreted as admission of guilt. The mediator, uh, who was um, a, Punjab, a Gujarati speaking um, accountant, uh, press ganged uh, into service by the court, um, did not communicate to her clearly for her purposes. Um, Mrs. Begum's particular dialect uh, was a Punjabi, uh, Pakistani dialect of Punjabi, not the main Punjabi language either. Uh, Mrs. Begum was released, but having spent four years in jail already, unable to bear the humiliation, she later killed herself. Under the joint cosh of the notorious Tory and Labour Private Finance, Finance Initiative, Initiative Drive, PFI, to privatise public services, the interpreting and translating services, which had for a while become grudgingly incorporated into ge general local or health initiated um, funded local authority services uh, and outfits, they, they started to become outsourced to private, non-local money-making outfits around the turn of the century, eventually succumbing to the reworked version of the racist rant, speak English, now sounding to our ears like learn English, but with no difference in funding or support involved. Thank you. Thank you, Kalyan. Um, that really brings it home, um, the real life implications of some of the topics which we talk about in academia um, in a kind of uh, detached manner as far as we can. Um, so, and it also brings to mind what would, um, the, Joseph's point in the last session about how uh, attitudes towards language um, may sometimes be uh, a mask for attitudes to attitudes towards people who speak those languages. Um, so thank you very much, Kalyan, for, for bringing us down to the ground on that one. Um, so I don't think I'm going to ask Jane to speak uh, because she's got a bad throat, but I'm very glad that she's listening in. And what we'll do is we'll ask her uh, at a later date to record her own experiences so that we can add them to this this uh, short uh, recording that we're making. Um, and uh, I'm sure that she's listening in very carefully and will make 
uh, apposite points in relation to what she hears uh, from the rest of us. So I'll move on directly to Audrey then, um, who can offer us another experience again. Thanks everyone. Um, I'm very moved to hear of the pain of being bilingual in this country, um, as well as, I'm sorry, I, I just want to say I'm sorry about that experience because some of us do experience racism in its, all its forms. Um, now, I came to the UK as a child, as I've mentioned before, and with my family, um, you know, we're Jamaican and we assumed we were speaking English, um, but we assumed it was bad English. Um, but in, within the family, um, there wasn't, as far as I, I felt, a judgment about speaking that way. Um, it was the way we spoke, and my reflections are possibly my parents, because they were latecomers to the UK. My father came when he was 42, so he was established, you know, he knew who he was as a person, and my mother was 10 years younger. And so they didn't, as far as I know, do anything to change how they spoke. Um, so they would have spoken Jamaican on different levels. And we did that within the home. But there was an expectation that we would acclimatise and accommodate and speak English properly. Um, so there was no sort of, as far as we were, when we were growing up, there wasn't a concept of this was another language. But internally, I felt it was another language because I had to learn it, whatever it was. And the, the thing that really all of us, we, you know, as children used to do would be to mimic people. And it was the rhythm of English that we thought was really funny because it was like, would you like a cup of tea? And it was, yes, please. And you had to, and, you know, in Jamaica, it was like, yes, no. You know, it was, you know, everything in Jamaica was very abrupt. And then you were seen to be rude if you didn't raise your voice and lilt alongside, you know, if you spoke in a very flat voice and said yes or no, that was wrong. And so you quickly learned to sort of put some different, different musicality to your voice. And that was for us learning English. Now, along the way, I, I sort of, we mimicked. And so whoever you were with, you changed your English, depending, so playing out in the streets, it was Cockney. Um, you know, I read a lot. So you, you saw received and you saw um, proper English written down, but often I didn't know how to pronounce it. So you had to do a lot of listening. So picture skew, I remember thinking, oh, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's a word, picture skew. And then remember, oh, my gosh, they say picturesque, you know, so little by little, you would sort of learn the language that way. Um, and I think actually what um, uh, Norman was saying, really, because what we experienced was two languages, well, languages at home that we didn't recognize as another language, but that was home, how we, we spoke. And we were comfortable speaking that way at home. And, and also in school, because I went to school, which was about at least 60% um, Black and Caribbean. And uh, again, a lot of people in my secondary school in particular spoke languages from um, St. Lucia and St. Kitts and other islands, which was Francophone. And we had no idea. And so they would go to their corners and cuss you and you know, do all sorts of things using those different languages. And um, we didn't have, we had no idea because everyone, it was, for them, it was bad talking. There was no multilingualism attached to it. And we, you know, as children, we played with that language. Um, what I, I actually think, and I, I think the thing that um, Norman really says is hold that language. And so to me, that was the, my mother tongue, literally, that's how my mother spoke. And it's quite interesting because my mother has passed, but I can't remember her voice. But when I see myself doing Jamaican, I think, oh my gosh, that reminds me of my mother. And it is, it is a rhythm of the language really that stays with us or stay, you know, stays with, with me. And back to the, the hierarchy, one of my friends, um, they come because we're different classes. And so we were sort of lower middle class, possibly my parents were trades people. And this other family, they were same number, like eight children and musical family and Jamaicans. And the mother was very posh. And I said to her one day, does your mother ever speak Jamaican at home? And she said, 
oh yes <laughs> and she said uh, one day some she was talking and really calling her and her name was lisa and it was lisa 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 and she, uh, she wasn't re replying and then somebody knocked on the door when she was in the middle of calling lisa and then suddenly she said oh i didn't know my name was lisa because her mother suddenly changed her name from the lisa to lisa and it was just interesting that that whole thing of adapting what what we thought was rhythm and language was a different pronunciation along the way i have learned and as joseph has shown the constructions of Jamaica, the, um, the grammatical systems of Jamaica, all the things that actually uh, makes Jamaica a composite language that I had a sense of because I learned languages. And I thought, no, this is another language. And people used to laugh at me because it's bad talking, Audrey, get over it, don't do it. Um, but I actually felt this is my home language. It's precious to me and I'm holding it. And in a way, I'm, I'm going to say, I mean, we've not had the, you know, the differences of um, different linguistic roots and so on in Jamaica to make it, well, as we say, back to the progression of language, it's, it's, a, it's a progressive language and lots of levels and even more progressive now that what we're doing with it in Jamaica. Um, but actually, um, I think the, the learning I've had to take from it really is to recognize that it's a heart language and not to, destroy that as part of because the last talk I did I realized the damage that had been done to me by not being able to pass that on to my daughter and it's reminded me and this is where I sort of get tearful because all the time Africans or Jamaicans are told you're talking gibberish we've been you know we've had the, the our original languages taken from us because it was gibberish we've been stopped from moving into our cultures because we weren't able to use our languages and now we are re-embracing our culture in in the way that we've we've grown together as a community and that's what really makes the language powerful for us so thank you thank you audrey thank you again another powerful testament and it's really good to get this these experiential accounts into the into the debate um and uh just to clock again the strongly uh, affective and emotional nature of, of much of this debate, um, which we don't actually do service to unless we acknowledge it, it seems to me. Um, so that's, it, it, I'm, I'm really glad to be hearing these testimonies. It's, it's, it's really adding to the, to the discussion that needs to be had, I think, in all sorts of ways. Um, so thank you both Kalyan and Audrey for those contributions, and we'll get Jane's uh, at a later stage. Um, let's move back into academia, though, and uh, come to Joseph first before asking Crocker to, to follow him. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, having sat and listened to Kalyan and Audrey, I'm not sure if I have to say anything, uh, which is one of the reasons I had encouraged the switch to have, uh, um, you know, well, we are all members of communities, uh, but the, the danger with us academics is that we move to the academic very quickly, um, forgetting um, the experiential side. And I think that's, that's so important. Um, there's something that uh, Uday mentioned that reminded me that all countries have uh, a language policy, all countries, um, whether that's an official language policy that is written down that you can find in a document somewhere, or it might be an unofficial official policy where you can't find it in a rule book, but this is how the state operates. This is how the state deals with its citizens and also deals with um, those who are not citizens. Um, in Jamaica, there is a provision in the law that says if you do not speak English, when you come before the justice system, you have the right to an interpreter. 
But that, um, the interpretation of that um, rule disenfranchises uh, hundreds of thousands of Jamaicans because the language that they speak naturally, this is the Jamaican language, is thought to be just a version of English. And so they do not need a translate, uh, an interpreter, sorry. And what this means is that somebody who comes from Spain on vacation or comes from Poland on vacation would get a right before a Jamaican to an interpreter in the legal system. And so this is the way that unofficial uh, language policies at the state level can severely um, disenfranchise um, citizens of the country. But then moving to Norman's uh, contribution, put me in mind about the language policy at the family level, which is often influenced by language policy at the community level. So you'll notice that Norman conveyed what is a very natural and a very pragmatic approach to the interaction between Gaelic and English. And for him, there was absolutely no question that people needed to learn English. It was just pragmatic. They need to get ahead. And so you have to learn English in order to get ahead. And then you need to pass on that English or give your children all the opportunities for learning English. But in the same breath, which I think not even Norman realized, what was happening is that the space, the, the fora, the domains for Gaelic were being reduced little by little and reduced to the point that even for an activist like Norman would accept that the Gaelic is spoken in the home. You know, so you feel quite comfortable speaking Gaelic in the home, but after a while you don't really understand that what you have done is that you have circumscribed your own language in such a way that you have given it a very narrow domain in which to operate. And so we have to look at, uh, which is something I mentioned in the previous session, the opportunities that are available because people make these decisions, which is what Norman uh, had said without understanding the, the power of what he was saying. People make those decisions based on sociopolitical um, tides. So what's happening in the country? What do the economics dictate? The economics dictate that if you want a good job, you have to speak English. If you want to go to a good school, you have to speak English. And in situations where none of these things are attached to the language of the home, then within two or three generations, children are going to ask themselves, what's the point? And before you know it, we are talking not about English ascendancy, but English only, which makes for a less interesting linguistic situation. Thanks, I'll leave it there. Thank you again, Joseph. Yep. Uh, I'll move straight on to Crawford, um, who perhaps thinks that Joseph has stolen some of his thunder or <laughs> I don't know. But if you can pull up any points which haven't been mentioned so far, Crawford, which you think are a, a, a germane part of this debate. Okay, thank you very much. It's always difficult to follow Joseph, but I'll, I'll try my best. <laughs> but I'm struck by um, both in Norman's piece and in the reactions to it, two things. The, 
these are very strong issues, the, the emotional aspect and the social aspect. And it's interesting for all of us living in the Anglosphere of the world, and then all discussions about minority languages or non-dominant non -dominant languages in the Anglosphere, they start with a discussion of English. That's coming close to what Joseph is saying there. We start off talking about minority languages, then we start talking about bilingualism, and we end up with the unavoidable dominance of English or English only, uh, basically. And uh, Uday's contribution, he talked about this, that again, the issue of power. Even after the British had left India in 1945, this, the need even to this day to make some accommodation with the language that holds so much cultural, uh, economic and social power uh, in the globe. But if um, I can go back to, if I go back to Norman for a second, and again, as I said in the, in the first discussion we had, just how um, perceptive uh, he is from his own uh, non-academic uh, analysis of what's happening. And I see four things coming up and they've come up in the discussions and the reactions up to now. The first is the centrality of English in the world. The second is minority language parents understanding the utility of English from the word go, basically, when, the, when they bring a family into the world. Then the other point, as Ude has expressed more eloquently than myself, it's the accommodation with the language of power that all minority, minority language families uh, have to contend with. And then there's the issue of the context of acquisition, home, communal, or institutional, or heritage-like. Uh, acquisition. And I'll just say a little bit more about all of them. If I start off with the centrality of English in the world, and a lot of the discussion we've had, it's reminding me of the books that uh, Abraham de Swan and uh, Louis-Jean Calvé have put out about word language systems. And we know, we refer now to English as the global language are the super central language. In other words, every language or every language group has some type of relationship with English because of its economic, global economic power. Then we have the mega languages like Russian, Arabic, Spanish, Portuguese, these languages that have millions of speakers and live within different, uh, exist in different states. Then we have the smaller national languages. So they have power in their own national context. And then all other languages, well over 6,000 languages that pertain to this other are peripheral, non-state, or uh, non-mega, or uh, they have, do not have this superpower status that other languages have. And this raises the question of what are the prospects for languages in the world, in the Anglo Anglosphere, the, the, the globe now dominated by English, for languages with weak demography and then weak political status um, and these are issues that the type of academic political and then local communal debates were probably not being earnest or frank enough with ourselves about the level of challenges involved if I can move ahead, uh, and uh, Kalyan and Audrey touched on this as well, that the minority language parents, um, that in a way this encapsulates the sociolinguistic challenges of protecting the continuity of small languages in the world, that parents, they feel torn, this is the emotional issue, they feel torn between loyalty uh, our ethno-linguistic loyalty to their own language, to their own culture, and then giving their children advantage with the language of wider communication or the language of power. Not in, in the Gaelic sense or in the Irish language sense, it's the accommodation you have to make um, with uh, English. That brings me on to the third point then, this uh, 
uh, accommodation. And that all parents know this as much as economic experts, that uh, to avail of socioeconomic opportunity, you must have the cultural capital of the language in which socioeconomic, socioeconomic opportunity uh, is available. This raises the issue then of what domains, what function and what cultural capital are left for the minority language, even in the circumstances where the parents and guardians want to protect the function and domain of family. In other words, some type of vernacular transmission of the language when they're in, com in, in competition with this accommodation with the language uh, of socioeconomic uh, advantage. And that brings us then to the fourth point, that this context of acquisition where the parents are struck with this imperative of having to acquire the majority language and obviously then that has implications not only for the context uh, or the domain uh, or the style of acquisition left for for the minority language if the parents aren't going to how would i put it accept responsibility for the transmission of the minority language in the home. The issue there is what other communal opportunities for acquisition of the minority languages, languages are left uh, if the emphasis is going to be on acquiring acquisition in the majority in the strong language as early uh, as possible. It's the challenge basically for the minority languages of we in the accommodation with the strong language the possibilities for vernacular familial communal acquisition acquisition are squeezed out therefore what functions what domains in the day-to-day -day use uh, uh, among the people that you have the most affection and love for what is left for that and this is an issue probably not just for society, uh, not just for academia, but also for the uh, political class. If the social praxis for the minority languages or non-dominant languages is going to be destroyed, to not to use too strong a word of it, because of the need for this early accommodation with the economic power uh, of English or other strong languages, well, the issue therefore is, are we discussing the reality of minority language, fragility, endangerment, vulnerability, whatever word we're going to use, in an honest, open and frank way to the level of challenge. And going back to Norman there, uh, he was very, this, with this word effective or emotional comes up quite a bit. His emotional appeal as well, not to forget the family domain uh, for Gaelic, but that's basically the core issue, how we protect this issue of societal practice for minority languages while parents and young people come to some type of accommodation with the language of power. Thank you, Crawford. Um, yeah, you've laid out some challenges there which are clear um, and well delineated. Um, I think what we've done is we've laid out um, some real issues. Um, and I've been struck by the number of times the word accommodation has come up. Um, and uh, if we're all acknowledging the instrumental importance of English, if we're not disputing that, um, then the question arises of what kind of accommodation is possible, uh, which doesn't end up erasing um, the other languages which we might wish to learn or to speak uh, in our daily lives. And I'm seeing Audrey uh, raising a finger there, so we'll definitely get to you there, Audrey. Um, but what I was just going to go on to say was that um, we don't have to have all the answers today. Uh, we've got language contact and bilingualism as our topic for discussion in our final session. So um, we can develop that more um, in 
in, uh, in, in, the, in the next session. Um, we're going to get Uday to finish, but please, if you have other points or questions before that, um, let's hear them. So we'll go to Audrey first, if that's okay. I, I probably would be better to keep this for the next day, actually, because it was just, well, in response to Kroche's, um point about sustainability of the language, I went to a conference some years ago about bilingualism and about high achievers who are most people recognize that if you're bilingual, you're going to be a, a high achiever. And it was graded and shown. And most of these languages, most of these people, this was in the UK, they, they kept their languages through Saturday schools. Um, and so that was one way of doing it. Um, I will say that, 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 that at some point I went to Saturday school and said, would you like to learn Jamaican? And it was like, what? <laughs> Absolutely not, you know, because, and so we won't go there. We'll do that another day. But it really depends on how that community recognizes the language as well. Thank you, Audrey. And, and Gordon, yeah. uh, just to point out, uh, that although accommodation recurs, uh, is generally accommodation in one direction. Yeah, um, I'm sure we'll come on to bi-directional versus unidirectional bilingualism in our next session. Um, but that's a good point uh, and well worth underlining now, Joseph, thank you. Any other questions or points before we ask Uday to make some closing remarks? Kalyan. Um, Interestingly, the Jamaican thing that um, was mentioned by Joseph can also work the other way. In the interpreting service, I encountered uh, situations where um, people with Jamaican accents, very heavy Jamaican accents, could not be understood by local authority British English speakers. And the, uh, the staff requested some sort of mediator to explain things to them in more standard British English, which raised all kinds of other tensions because it was often seen as a slur and a slight on the Jamaican accented speaker. Uh, so a lot depends on social context, which none of us have missed here. Uh, everyone has uh, stressed rightly the context being important, the socio-political economic context. Take it out of the context, anything can mean anything. Um, and in, uh, as last point, I'd say Kroha's point about uh, emotion, which I thought was a very important point. Um, someone like Uday, who practices, who has cultural practice in multiple languages, will immediately recognize emotion is so crucial. It's only not crucial to someone like Mr. Gradgrind of Charles Dickens has had hard times who could only understand facts and went around the world ranting facts, 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 and nothing but facts, because it was only facts that marry, um, mattered for profits, capitalist profits. But if you're not a, a slave to capitalism and its ethos, then emotions matter a lot. And emotions are the foundation of the kind of culture that can only be nurtured and fed by mother tongues. And piggybacking on what you said, um, um, Kalyan, and um, also combining that with the, the sort of psychological trauma that Audrey spoke about, uh, the long-term effects of uh, uh, these prejudicial or biased um, approaches to language. This is something I, I, I struggle with um, in my students, um, students who speak two languages, who have been made aware because they do linguistics, but who will talk about um, the English language, the Polish language, the French language, the Spanish language, uh, and then talk about the African dialects. Why, why are they dialects? Uh, you know, why have you switched your terminology in talking about African languages? Um, and so it does, you know, at, at all levels, the psychological, the economic, etc. Um, there are these things that still need to be worked out uh, because it's seen as business as usual um, for some people. But uh, how we think uh, eventually ends up influencing how we act. Uh, we might not think it, but because you think of the languages as dialects, uh, this may influence uh, how you treat uh, a Ghanaian the next time you meet him 
who speaks more languages than you, but because in your head, they are dialects, um, you give him a different sort of, uh, of treatment than um, you give a person from England who only speaks English. Or not to um, um, delay, not to delay us, but uh, somebody pointed out to me, a colleague, uh, when he was still on staff at the University of the West Indies, how he had noticed that students uh, would treat um, lecturers of African descent and uh, so Black Africans different from how they would treat uh, um, white lecturers, sometimes from England. So, they may have difficulties understanding both because of accent. But whereas they will do the necessary work to understand the European, because something must be wrong with them, <laughs> they are already writing up the Black African because this person needs to make him or herself compre you know, comprehensible. You know, why can't they speak so that I can understand? You know, but they can't understand the, the white European. So even within that context, you have different reactions, different um, treatment, um, all based on those intersectionalities of you know, race, uh, sometimes gender comes in um, and, and so on. People here are all probably familiar with the saying, a language is a dialect with an army behind it. Audrey. I, I, so, uh, thank you, um, everyone. I just wanted to add to Joseph's point earlier about the language in court, and that you might be aware that in the UK, um, Jamaican a translator is available in court for Jamaicans. So Jamaicans have to leave the country, leave their own country in order uh, to get an interpreter. Some of life's absurdities are actually not really that funny, are they? But there we are. Um, I, I do want to draw it to a close now, if that's OK, folks. Um, so I just invite Uday to come back and make any closing points. Yeah, thank you, Gordon. Um, actually, Norman's point about the, his appeal that learning this Learn English very well, proper English, but at least retain your own language at home. You know, one can look at it as an interpretation. One can actually interpret it as accommodation. But <clears throat> I would say that this accommodation is in the blood of every Indian because our language hierarchies are a little different. So you're talking about the dialect that Joseph has used, uh, we have coined a new term. And this term was, again, thanks to the British administration, called mother tongue. And you know, mother tongue has been defined in our census in 10 different ways. Different census operations define it differently. And yet, they say that this is all mother tongue. So all those 3,500 mother tongues, or the dialects that are spoken in India, that's being talked about, 1652 uh, rationalized mother tongues and 1792 uh, other mother tongues. It's very interesting terms that they've chosen. And they do not really have the right to uh, be used uh, in the loose sense, not in the legal sense, because the constitution says you can also write in your mother tongue uh, an appeal to the court or to the government, etc. But actually, it doesn't happen like that. Now, where English comes, the problem with uh, the word of accommodation in Indian context is that in Indians are the probably the greatest accommodation people because uh, one of the British journalists had asked me one day, uh, "Can you tell me what exactly is the dictionary entry of the word jugar in India?" So I had to tell him that this is perhaps going to enter into Oxford Dictionary very soon. But Jugar in India is accommodation. And anything that you want to know, you don't, you don't think this machine is going to work? Yes, it will work because there are, there are mechanics 
who can make it work in India with Indian system of adjusting the you know various parts of the machine with Indian uh, you know small small parts. Actually, in terms of language, when Star TV entered in India, the announcement was that this is the death of all Indian language television. Now there will be Star, and there will be English, and English, and English, nothing else. I think somebody somewhere must be laughing because what happened is now we have Star Bangla, Star Hindi, Star Marathi, Star Gujarati, anything Star including ZTV, okay, so Z Marathi, Z Bangla, Z Hindi, ETV, also ETV in so many languages. So multilingualism is not going to leave us. What we are going to do is, instead, we're going to learn English so well and start producing the best possible writers of fiction and poetry in English, so much so that the British bookshop will be flooded by Indian authors. And I've been noticing this as I travel through Europe, that the best possible bestsellers are all Indian authors. So I was quite surprised that what is this? Is it a written strategy to, uh, to master the language of uh, the colonial rulers and then upset them? Or is it an unwritten strategy <laughs> that has happened here? But whatever it is, I think Norman's policy, Norman, of course, was no, any kind of, he was in a, feeling cornered. You know? by the advent of that language. But English uh, did not threaten us so much or didn't surprise us so much because we had our own strength of languages. And now, as I notice from the ICANN statistics of language use on the internet, and this is a recent uh, survey that was done by KPMG that uh, next year, uh, Indian language internet is crossing over the English internet volume, which is very surprising. If you actually add up to Tamil and Hindi and another major Telugu uh, internet users, it is already, sur already surpassed English. But no, one single language is going to be more used than English language. So in a way, it's a very interesting game that is happening in India that in India, a new kind of language hierarchy is emerging. If you look at the 22 languages in the constitution, all of them are not doing so well. About eight of them are really competing with English. Another eight are competing with the first set of eight. And the third group of people, the group of languages, they are trying to struggle and find their feet. So this is the kind of hierarchy, graded hierarchy that is happening here. Now we would be failing in our, uh, understanding of the of the point that Norman was making, if we did not raise the issue of diglossia, or in French diglossie, which Marsai had talked about, and then Ferguson had talked about, and Fishman had popularized that, that English and Indian languages are kind of a high court, low court situation. Uh, thus that you had the uh, Arabic al Nafsa al Fusa, uh, the Greek system of and Demotiki. Now, if similarly in Indian languages system or Indian system, English is there in the as a high court. But if you if you cannot speak Hindi very well, being a Tamilian, being a Bengali, or being a Marathi, then you are not able to manage the L code. And you are below somewhere, neither high nor there, and all these various other Indian languages are still below are those mother tongues. This is a kind of hierarchical system that has emerged in the Indian context. But I'm not sure uh, if this is not the case in Nepal. Perhaps this is also the case in Nepal and to some extent in Pakistan, not in Bangladesh. Bangladesh situation is a little different because Bengali dominates so much uh, that Bangladeshis are very prime because they, uh, they got their space or the land or the nation on the strength of language. But um, otherwise, in South Asia, everywhere, including in Sri Lanka, English has played this kind of a role of being a role of, of an elite language, of a language of the people of particular class. And everybody, since they want to move up in the class hierarchy, so to be able to move up, the key to success is English. So that's why it works like that. But nobody is going to leave their own language. 
this is the interesting thing that's happening and i'm sure there is a lesson to learn definitely uh, from the south asian context in this case for many other minority language groups thank you for for making that point uday um this series has has happened as a result of the mediating multilingualism project in which um scottish and indian and jamaican universities are working together um it's been money from the uk government overseas development which has actually funded it um, and uh, so there's an obligation to make sure that what comes out of the project um, is of benefit to countries in the global south what all of that misses is what we in the global north stand to gain from engaging in this kind of debate with uh, indian and jamaican practitioners um, so we're very grateful and we're um, certainly very cognizant of the the things that we can learn particularly in our minoritized situation with scottish gaelic from the different experiences uh, which are coming out uh, for, for, from your geographies. So thank you very much for that. Uh, noting also your use of the introduction of the term diglossia, which again is not going to be uh, a million miles away from our topic in uh, our third session, um, looking at language contact and the question of bilingual balance, question mark, raising the question of um, what kind of accommodation if accommodation is indeed the right word, can be reached um, between languages in what we sometimes say is not a zero sum game. Um, but what do we actually mean by that? So to find out more, you'll have to watch the next session. Thank you all very much uh, for, for joining us and uh, we'll be back again soon. Thank you, Gordon, for um, inviting me to, to you know, give an account of my own lived experience as a native Gael. Um, before I, I go on to um, speak about that, I'd like to echo Audrey's words and um, to thank um, Kaylan for, for um, bearing witness to um, the awful experiences of um, immigrants to the UK who, you know, have all these intersectionalities and not having English just um, just finishes them completely and they're, they're just chewed up by these institutions, by these monoliths. Um, that hasn't really happened to Gales probably for 100 years now. But um, there's enough folk memory for, for it to chime um, and it's it's very important that he makes this and continues to make this part of anti-racism education that it isn't simply a matter of color but also of language um, my own upbringing um, was you know, as a native Gael, raised in, in the Outer Hebrides, um, our Gaelic has been with us as long as there has been Gaelic, it's just been passed on as our mother tongue. Um, I grew up in a, a household with three generations, as did pretty much everyone of my generation, with lots of siblings and parents who spoke Gaelic to each other, but a grandparent um, who had the good Gaelic, the old style Gaelic. Um, and our social life revolved around our village and neighbours and relatives, um, all of whom also spoke Gaelic. We, we seldom went to store in a way um, to the world of you know, English speakers there. It, it was you know, a couple of times a year. So it was a very um, rural upbringing with crofting and, and weaving just sewn into the fabric of life. And where the older generation had played a very um, big part 
in, in community life. And in my daughter's generation, I was lucky enough to be able to give her the same thing as did my siblings with their children. They were a cohort and they had their, their granny um, governing their um, acquisition of Gaelic, I suppose, um, because we were often out working. Um, so in Stornoway as well, you know, not even here, but actually living a dormitory existence and commuting to, to work elsewhere. So that's a change that happened in my, my daughter's generation. Um, but she's probably the last um, now in her 20s who, who experience um, that, that collective, um, although it would be lovely to replace it with something else um, that might be effective for keeping the language going as a community language rather than just as a family language, um, as Joseph has, has um, referenced, you know, that the constrained domains um, don't help and there's no need of it today. Um, so changes that have happened socially, I suppose the main one is that our peer group is, you know, the group that we socialize with rather than um, our village or our elders. And many of our peer group have no Gaelic, so that does make our social lives much more English as well. Um, not that, that numbers of, of English speakers makes a difference. People talk about the, you know, the tsunami of English speakers, but there have always been English speakers. And it only takes one to make um, a room go English just because we're civil and we're polite and we want to include them. So numbers are not really the issue. English itself, mm, it's, it's change of lifestyle rather than English and and the different domains that we now experience. Um, probably what does or has been doing the greatest damage to us um, as families and as individuals has been the ascendancy of Sil Nagalic, um, which is the, the world of Gallic development. Um, probably about 30 years ago, a little more than that, um, Gallic became a national project, not a big one at that point, it was universities and some politicians um, seeking to restore it as a national language and um, actually centering themselves by and large in, in that project. Um, so resources and governance of Gallic, um, professionals who worked in Gallic gradually steered towards um, creating new communities um, rather than um, having any focus in the islands and our autonomy over our own Gaelic kind of slipped away as well as Gaelic education as determined by the centre um, took hold and you were either for it or against it and if you're not yet for it you're out in the cold and not really permitted to um, have any sense of agency um, with regard to things you might wish to do um, with regard to Gaelic. But that's a, a, a factor of, of living in a, a region like this anyway, developing culture, agencies, bureaucrats dominate um, rather than, you know, working with communities. So um, I think we're at the point where we're now a little bit like my grandpa was when he was an immigrant to Canada, where you know Gaelic was a minority language. He never lost his Gaelic, nor did any of his friends. Um, they were of a generation by and large. And they kept their community alive as by being aware they were a diaspora and keeping Gaelic alive in church and in Cayleys and clustering in neighborhoods and having um, professional brotherhood especially in the absence of trade unions back in the day. And he held on to his Gaelic. Um, his letters home to family were always written in, in English because that's what people did. But he could certainly read Gaelic very well. He could write it, um, as could my granny, who, who you know, was a bard in her own right. So 
they were able to keep um, their galley going because we're aware of its um, the risk of losing it um, and of opportunities as being scarce. Um, and we're at that point now, but um, we don't have the autonomy to um, do what they did. It's, it's denied us in a way. Um, why this is, is, is a little baffling. I, I, I don't think we're a problem to anyone, but there has um, been this practice of, um, as, as described by um, Professor Gilligan, where a middle class emerges and it serves itself rather than you know the community that it, it um, relies on for its justification and its existence. Um, since the publication of the book, things have improved a little bit for us in terms of um, we're no longer um, experiencing you know, the mockery and the pylons and intimidation online that were the norm prior to its publication. Um, and there's been a lot of backpedaling um, as you know, it became apparent that actually to most Scots and most people globally who have an interest in Gaelic, um, you know, the notion that native speakers would not be central to efforts to save the language um, it's actually quite shocking to them. There has been a lot of um, intention to separate the language from um, a cohort that is seen as, as being um, low in the social pecking order, as disempowered, um, as unworthy of this, this language and its heritage and culture. Um, there's also been the notion of making um, Gaelic medium education central to the reversal of language shift. Um, when it's a system that isn't really designed for our needs, but for you know, those who have no Gaelic as a starting point. So that together with the you know, disparagement of us culturally and the diverting of you know, Gaelic professionals and resources, um, and actually our population, our young population towards uh, the national project of, of Gaelic is quite staggeringly um, bold. Um, it's quite an experience um, to be back here in the island, knowing that people definitely now know what the situation is, it's been published. Um, and to see the denial of it in those circumstances is, is um, a body blown, really, to, to those of us who thought, well, maybe they just don't realise. They do. It is structural. It is intentional. And um, we are where we are. So how we go on with that, I suppose we will talk about in the next session.